One of the strangest things for people today about human history is how crazily similar everything is. Nothing really changes from the time we evolve in Africa to when we discover fire to when we discover agriculture and the rise of cities. Things look very much the same and they take a very long time. We're talking tens of thousands of years before anything really happens. This is very different than today when we are living in a period of constant change. I mean, if you look at the sort of material life of ancient Rome, it looks very similar to the material life of the 17th century. There's been very little change. And so when we talk about capitalism, we're talking about a break with history itself, a break with this sort of long-term stasis. And historians call this the Malthusian stasis. So Ed, where, where do we get this idea from? What, who, who was Malthus and Malthusian and what, what's that all about? So Thomas Malthus was an English clergyman who was uh, writing in the late 1700s. And looking at human history, he noticed that, that although sometimes things seemed to change, really there was a pattern of no substantial change. You would have the rise and then the fall of a civilization or a society or what have you. And in fact, what was happening was a constant recurrence of a pattern that's familiar from the, the natural world. Mm. So if any of us have, have taken a biology class, we, we probably run across this uh, um, example of the relationship between the Canadian lynx and the snowshoe hare. So the lynx eats the snowshoe hare. Well, every time the population of the snowshoe hare rises because of maybe some environmental change, maybe it's warmer and there's more food, then the population of the lynx will also rise because there's more food for the lynx. But of course you have more lynxes, they eat more hares, all of a sudden the population of hares drops and then the population of lynxes falls as well. And so what happens? Do, do the lynxes then start raising hares in factories and farms and things like that to supply their growing population? Well, no, no, they don't. And in fact, human beings for 10,000 years after the invention of agriculture, uh, almost 10,000 years, that's, that's a really long time. It's mm -hmm. 100 centuries. Again and again, we're not able to substantially increase uh, their ability to extract resources from their own environment. The nature of human civilization, the material culture you were talking about, yeah. Lewis is right. It just doesn't change at any kind of rapid pace. If a society was able to get 1% growth rate uh, in, their, in their economy, 1% uh, increase in their GDP, we'd say today, then that was incredible. But societies weren't able to sustain no, it. No, not at all. I mean, and this is, this is the real difference. And so when we look at the sort of origins of capitalism, in fact, the origins of modernity, it's a radical break with this Malthusian stasis, this economic cul-de-sac. And so how do we think about why this rupture happened? How, what was changing the years, let's say, uh, in the 14th century? I mean... What, what changes in Europe in particular, I think, yeah. is, is uh, significant. Well, Europe has just been through uh, the, um, the whole process of social collapse in mm -hmm. the 1300s. Um, they'd had a lot of success, an increasing population over the previous couple of centuries, and all of a sudden things just go horribly wrong in, in Europe. You've got uh, an epidemic, the Black Plague, the population drops by a third, there are wars, et cetera, et cetera. And things seem to be prospering in the wake of that in the 1400s. The yeah, prices are rising, especially wage prices, right. because there's so few people. This is almost like a post-apocalyptic landscape. Europe right. is rebuilding after the Black Plague. And so this, this is a place where there's incredible pr price put on human labor. And that changes, this is what Malthus was talking about, right? That, that he cha it changes the, the very values that people operate under. Yeah, well, it changes people's behavior. Now, uh, if the, the price of labor is high, uh, then what you want to do is have more children and get them to go out in the fields with you and, and plant crops because you know you're going to get a great return on that, uh, on that labor. And there's abundant food. There's mm -hmm. enough to go around for everybody. Of course, again and again, over time, what had happened was that the population rose too quickly uh, they were uh, not able to sustain uh, the population, and it, it dropped again. And so what happens is something in the 15th century. Now, Ed's a historian, so when I ask him this question, it's a perfectly fair one. What happened in 1492, Ed? Um, I don't know. Uh, give me a hint. Give me, give me some help. 
maybe a first letter. Maybe uh, I can call a lifeline. Maybe call a lifeline, yeah. yeah. So this is when Europe so-called discovers the New World. Now, after all, people had lived in the New World for tens of thousands of years. But for Europeans, it was a way to overcome this limit, Just to have a massive injection of resources that were not being used, natural resources, that were not being used in the New World in the way that Europeans would have used them. So a massive injection of land, a massive injection of, of new ways to create trade that really rejuvenates uh, Europe, which was on the, the cusp of another dieback, uh, basically. Right. So uh, Europe then goes through a couple of centuries of expansion, but ultimately the same thing could have happened. Uh, we could have had the same uh, sequence of, um, of rapid growth or relatively rapid growth and then um, overpopulation and collapse. But what happens in the 1700s, and if you look at the, the graph that, that we've shown you, the economic history of the world in, in one picture, what you see is a rapid rate of increase such had, as had never happened before in human history in the, uh, the GDP uh, of Western European societies. Uh, in their over in the size of their overall economies, and this is tied to the transfer of old world labor systems and old world ideas of uh, technology to new world natural resources, and so the transition of of sugar slavery slavery plantation to the new world, coupled with all these new resources, creates a boom in many ways in Europe that we'll be talking about. So what, what happened uh, ultimately is that uh, what Malthus said couldn't happen actually begins to happen in his own lifetime. He doesn't, he doesn't necessarily recognize it as it's going on around him, but people are starting to see it. He had said that uh, population, human populations can increase geometrically. So one couple can, in the right conditions, raise 8, 10, 12 children to, to adulthood. It sounds exhausting. Yeah. Um, but um, I, I can't you know, uh, <laughs> recover from raising two, it feels like. But, um, but the reality is that, that um, the resources, the ability of those people to um, turn the resources of the natural world into things like food and fuel and so on, that only increases arithmetically, right? Uh, there's only so much land on the, the island of Britain, for instance. But that equation starts to change mm -hmm. in the 1700s as human beings go through rapid transformations that increase their ability uh, to, to drive economic growth. It's the beginning of modern capitalism. It's the way in which humans begin to be able to invest in new ways of production, increasing their productivity, reorganize their work so as to be more productive as well. And this allows a massive takeoff in population, in economic growth from that time until today.